everyone. Today we are going to start a new unit called Populations. So I'll give you a second to write down that title in your notes, but um, this is actually a part of ecology, so this is yet again another unit that's going to come back to you next um, year, next semester when you take biology. And all ecology is, it's a part of biology, but it's basically where you are observing different animals and organisms within nature trying to better understand them. So if I was an ecologist, I might notice that there's a population of birds that keep migrating at a particular time. And I could study to see why it is they're showing that behavior. And if you remember from Unit 3, it could be because those birds can actually predict hurricane season, which is pretty awesome. Um, okay, so you don't need to write this slide down because hopefully you already know it. Now, if you've completely forgotten everything, feel free to jot it down. But what a population is, based on what we learned in our previous unit, is all the individuals of the same species that are at the same area at the same time. So a group of um, 10 zebras is a population because they belong to the same species. A group of 50 fish um, or flounder, they are a population because again, they are the same species living together at the same place at the same time. Now today when we talk about population, we're not gonna be referring to it in the sense of the same species, well we are going to refer to it in the sense of the same species, but we're going to look at a different aspect of it, which is size. So we're going to talk a lot about population size, but we're also going to look at population density and dispersion. So these are the three key features that we're going to look at when you study a population. You're going to see what the size of the population is, how dense the population is, and then how is that population dispersed. So based off of these names, you could probably kind of guess what it is we're going to talk about. Um, but So hopefully I'll make the test a little easier, but we are going to go into a little bit more detail about some things that you may not know. But it will be a short unit, so um, hang in there. Only two days of notes. Okay, our first factor we're going to look at is size. So size is the number of the individuals in an area. So looking at this picture, what is the size of the population? Well, the size, hopefully you got this right, is two. There are two swans, so therefore the size is two. It would be a population of two swans. Um, now before I move on and as you write, I just want you to look at these swans and observe how weird their necks are. Every time I see this picture, the longer I look at it, especially that one swan in the back, he just has a really long neck. But they almost remind me of like the giraffe of the bird population because of that long neck. But the longer you stare at those birds, the weirder they get. Interesting, but, and I've also heard they're kind of mean. But, yeah, just look how weird. It looks like a snake almost. It's weird. Anyway, let's move on to um, more about size. So when you're measuring what the size of the population is, one thing that's going to determine how fast it's growing is um, the birth rate minus the death rate. So when you talk about the growth rate of a population, you have to take into consideration how many individuals are being born into it, as well as how many individuals are dying out of it. You can't just look at one or the other. So not to be too morbid, but the day that my niece was born was the same day that my brother-in-law's grandmother died. So you couldn't say just because my niece was born that the population grew by one. Well, it actually didn't grow at all because birth rate was plus one, death rate was minus one, so growth rate, at least in that one particular situation, equaled zero. So whenever you're looking at your growth rate, you've got to take into consideration not just birth rate, but also death rate. Now, down here in the corner, you've got a picture of three graphs. And I know y'all love graphs, which is great, because later you're going to make one. But these graphs, these are called an age structure. And they are showing you the structure of the ages within a population. So you've got three of them down here at the bottom. One is Kenya, one's the United States, and one is Italy. Now, the Kenya one is showing rapid growth, while the one on the far side, Italy, is showing no growth. And the reason for that is look at Kenya. Look at the bottom population for the younger ages because the younger ages is down here on there's the whole row of numbers. Zero to four is down the very first bar, and it goes up to 80. 
So if you're looking at the age structure of Kenya, they've got a bunch of young people and a bunch of people in the birthing years, and they don't have many people in the older years where more than likely the people would pass away soon. So they are probably they have a much higher birth rate than you would think death rate based on your ratio of young to old people. Now if you look at Italy and you look at the bottom versus the top, it's almost even. The amount of people they have born into the population that's like um, the age of zero to four is almost even with the number of people who are 80 years old or over. So their birth rate and death rate are probably going to be about equal and that's why it would be no growth. So age structures make observations like that a little bit easier for you to see and you get to make your own. Yay! But we'll get to that later. First, more notes. So our second factor that we're going to look at when measuring um, populations is the density. Now in unit one, we talked about what the formula of density is. And hopefully you can remember, but density equals mass divided by volume. Remember, mass is how much stuff is in an area of space. Um, or excuse me, I'm talking about density. Mass is the stuff, so the amount of matter, and then volume is the space. So density is how much stuff is in a particular area of space. In this instant for populations, the stuff we are referring to are the individuals. So it's how many individuals per area of space. So if you look at the classroom right now, if there's not that many people in there and all the desks aren't filled, which they shouldn't be unless the class grew a lot in my absence, then the class really isn't that dense. But there's two ways that we could increase the density. One, we could bring over some other people from another class. Maybe Ms. Gardner's or Ms. Curry's class will all come in our room. With all those new individuals, we now have a much more dense population in here. The other way that we could increase density is not by adding individuals, but instead decreasing our space. So if you left only y'all in the room, you didn't add any more people, but the wall started to shrink in and you condensed the classroom size to half of its volume, then y'all would be a lot more crowded, so therefore the density would go up. So you can increase density by increasing the number of individuals or by decreasing the space, and that's because of the way that um, the formula is set up. Okay, so hopefully you're done writing down that one sentence, so I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide. As always, pause as needed. Um, so I got a bunch of words for you, a bunch of vocabulary words. These are words that not only affect density, but they also affect your population size, because remember size is directly related to the density of the area. So to determine population size, we were doing growth rate, which was birth rate minus death rate. But there are two other ways that you can add individuals in or take them out of a population. One way is called immigration. And yes, by the way, in case you're wondering, you do need to write all of this down. So immigration is movement in to a population. Notice immigration starts with the letter I. And the word in or into also starts with the letter I. Ah, so immigration is the movement into a population. Emigration, number two, is the movement out of a population. Emigration starts with an E, and so does the word exit. That's how I remember it, E, exit. So if individuals are emigrating out of the population, they are exiting the population. If they're immigrating, they are coming in to the population. Now, a lot of people, when they say these two words, they pretty much say them so that they sound the exact same. That's why I try to really emphasize if it's immigration versus immigration. Because if you don't emphasize that E, people mess it up. Um, and Or they don't know what you're talking about. But on your test, thankfully, you'll actually be able to see it. But just remember, immigration into, immigration exit out. They're leaving. Um and that is better than them dying because if they're emigrating out, they're probably moving away so they can find more resources like more water, more shelter, um, or you know things like that. Now the next one is density dependent factors and then density independent factors. So if you think back to unit one, 
we talked about um, independent variables and dependent variables. And so this is along the same um, kind of terms. So a density dependent factor are factors that change depending on the density. So if I increase my density, I increase the effect this factor will have. If I decrease my density, I decrease the effect this factor will have. So I'll give you a few examples. Now typically these factors are biotic, meaning that they are living things. That Now listen to this, okay? That does not mean all biotic factors are a density dependent factor. So when you get your study guide tomorrow and I tell you to describe density independent and dependent factors, don't tell me density dependent factors are just biotic things. No, they have to be things that have a higher effect as population or, di or density increases. Because grass isn't going to be a biotic factor if it's not affecting anything on the population. It's or a density dependent if it's not affecting, even though it's biotic. It has to be affecting the population more with a higher density or having less of an effect with a smaller density. Okay, it's directly tied to density. So let me give you a couple examples to hopefully make this make a little bit more sense. So disease, like bacteria or viruses. Um, Parasites or even competition. These are all examples of your density dependent factors. So let's take COVID for an example because it's been around us for years now. Um, so if you are in an area that is more crowded because it's more dense, then COVID is more likely to spread, just like with any disease. So if you have a disease within the population, if the density is high, then that disease is going to affect it more because it's going to be able to spread out. Now, I'm sure some of y'all have seen those movies with the crazy people, like the terrorists who are um, planning an attack and they're making some virus go out. And um, they, if you're going to do that because you're a crazy person, then you're going to go to a really dense area like New York City on a subway. You're not going to go to the middle of Arkansas and infect one farmer. Because you infect that one farmer out in the middle of nowhere in Arkansas, he's not going to come in contact with anyone but a cow. And so he's not going to be able to pass that disease around. But if you did in New York, where it was really dense on the subway, it would have a higher effect. So that's how it's a, it depends directly on the density. Um, another example would be competition. So the more individuals in an area, the more competition for food. So if I have a pizza that I bring into the room and I have enough pizza for one slice for everybody, there's not that much competition going on because everybody knows they're going to be able to get their own piece of pizza. However, if we start bringing in some other students from other classes and we have that same number of pizza and that's it, there's going to be a whole lot more competition because only about half of the people are going to actually get the piece of pizza. So that has a higher effect based on density. Um, and that goes the same if I decrease the population. So if there's less people and I still have the same number of slices, there's definitely not as much competition because then there'd be enough um, for everybody to get at least five pieces of pizza. So competition goes down because density went down. Competition goes up if density goes up. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, ask a friend, ask me, or ask Miss Elliot. Um, now, number four, density independent factors. These are factors that are going to affect the population regardless or independently of the density. So I want you all to imagine that you're a little squirrel and you're living out in a forest. It, and these factors are typically abiotic factors such as weather, natural disasters, temperature, things like that. So you're a little squirrel living in your little forest and all of a sudden a forest fire comes blazing through. That fire is going to affect the area in the same way regardless of how many squirrels there were. If there are five squirrels living in the forest, that um, fire is still going to burn everything down. If there were 50 squirrels living in the forest, the fire is still going to burn everything down. So either way, you lost your habitat. It doesn't matter if you had how many squirrels you had, the fire is affecting you in the same way. Now, another example would be drought. If you have a drought and you get rid of all the water in the area, it doesn't matter if you just had, you know, two elephants or if you had 200 elephants. If there's no water, no elephants can live. So these are things that are affecting it regardless of the population. Last example I'll give you on this, but a hurricane. 
if a hurricane comes through and it, you know, is to flood or tear down this school, it wouldn't matter if this was a, or we'll use a tornado instead of a hurricane. If a tornado came through, it wouldn't matter if there was a school pop size that was 200 or a school size that was 1,000 people. If the school was gone, the school was gone. The number of students it could hold didn't change the effect a tornado would have. But don't worry about that. That's not going to happen. We don't live in Tornado Alley. So you're safe. Okay, um, moving on. If you have exam or questions, please let me know. You can email me. I'll do my best to get to the emails as soon as I can. And our last factor that we're going to look at um, today is dispersion. Dispersion is talking about how dispersed or spaced out the individuals are. You can look at the classroom and see the dispersion of the desk, the way that they are spaced out. Are they uniformly spaced out or are they clumped together? Or are they randomly put throughout the room? Those are the three um, dispersions that you usually see. If it, a, if it is a clumped dispersion pattern, that typically means it's in groups. If it's uniform, then they're pretty evenly spaced out from one another. And then if it's random, there's no rhyme or reason. There may be like parts that are clumped, parts that are really spaced out, and so on. So that's what they mean. Um, and on the next slide, I'm going to show you some little clusters of dots to give you examples and a visual of what clumped, uniform, and random would look like. What I want you to do while we wait for our slower writers to finish writing down their notes is I want you to think, what are some examples of species that may show a clumped pattern? And you can call this out if you want. What are species that would travel in groups? Like a group or a pack. Well, if you said or thought a school of fish, they're clumped, they're in a group, or um, a pack of wolves, we are the wolves, they travel in groups, so they would show clumped patterns. And I'm sure there are others, but at the moment, that's all I can think of. Okay, so I'm going to move on. So fish, I already gave you that example, but that's giving you um, a visual of what the clumped pattern would look like. Penguins are actually pretty uniform. They space themselves out um, pretty evenly when they are laying their eggs or sitting on their eggs waiting for them the other penguins to bring little fishies back for them to eat. Um, and plants are typically very random. Um, think about a lot of seeds are dispersed based on wind. So there's not a lot of order to where the seeds fall. They just go throughout, so they typically have a very random pattern. Okay, you don't have to write this slide down, but this is just a nice little visual reminding you of all the things that could affect population growth or population size. So birth rate and immigration are the two things that would add to the population. Death and emigration are the two things that would take away from the population. So just wanted to review that one more time. So now the question is, how do we measure the actual population size? So this isn't saying what affects the growth of birth rate, death rate, immigration, immigration. This is saying how do we actually know the specific number of individuals within that population? Well, if you are an ecologist trying to figure this out, there are two things you can do. One thing you can do is simply count the individuals. So right now in this classroom, it would be easiest to count the population. If I want to see how many people there are in here, I could just count one, two, three, four, five, and so on. But if I take you out to the ocean and I tell you to count the number of hammerhead sharks that live on the East Coast, you're not going to be able to do that. One, there's going to be too many, and two, they're going to be too hard to find and get to or to see. Um, so that would not be an accurate thing for you to do. In an instance like that, what you would have to do is something we call estimate by samples. There's a lot of different versions of this. The one version we're going to talk about is called mark and recapture. So basically, the way this would work, we'll use hammerheads. You go out to the ocean, and you'd go fishing, and you'd catch you a big old hammerhead, and you would tag him. That would be what the mark is. In this picture, you can see that the hammerhead has a yellow tag on his fin. So that would be the mark that you would give. And after you catch them and you mark them, you throw them back in the water, 
and he swims on and continues living his little life. Then you're going to go fishing again, and you're going to catch some more sharks. And you are going to keep notes, because that's what scientists do, and you're going to write down the data of how many sharks you caught that are new sharks versus how many are recaptured sharks. You're going to know that they're recaptured because you'll catch them and you'll see the mark or the tag you already put on them. And so you're going to keep writing that stuff down, and then you're going to end up putting it in a formula. And so I'm going to change the slide right now to show you what the formula is. So here's the formula. Do not write this down. But um, basically what you're going to do is you're going to take the number of marked individuals in the first catch multiplied by the number of um, individuals caught in your second catch, and you're going to divide that by how many individuals were recaptured, so the ones you caught that were already marked. And you're going to do that, and then every single time you go fishing, you're going to do the same thing, and you're going to add them up. So you'd have, you know, round one plus round two plus round three plus round four and so on, and then you'll find the average of it. And strangely enough, however math works, this does work. It is very accurate. So just to give one more example, you, you have this picture up here of this man fishing. And he catches some fish, and he takes them up, and he marks them, he throws them, throws them back in the water, and then you can see his second capture over here on the right, where he catches new fish, and again, he would write down how many was um, recaptured versus not, and do that formula. Now, I'm not going to have you try it, because I'm just not going to, but what I would have done had I been there is given you a bag of beans, and you would have worked in groups, and we actually had to do this at ECU when I took ecology in the lab. But you get like a bag of pinto beans or something, dried beans, and you would fish out a couple with your hand. Um, you get a small handful, and you get a sharpie, you color them in. That's you marking them. You put them back in the bag. Next thing you do is you shake up the bag. And you do that because individuals, real-life individuals, they don't sit still in the same area unless you're a tree. But if you're an animal, you're going to move around. So you'd shake it up, and then you would do it again. You'd catch some more, and you could compare how many you marked versus how many were new beans that you hadn't caught before. And you do that again and again and again and again. So then the question is, well, how do you know when to stop? Well, you know when to stop because you are catching more recaptured beans than new ones. And once you've done that for a few times, you know you're nearing the end of your um, sampling session. That's when you start doing all the math, and historically, it becomes very, very accurate, which is pretty awesome. Okay, so last thing we're going to talk about is this age structure. Now, if you have gotten bored and tuned me out, then wake up, because this is the last little bits of notes until you make your own age structure, and I want you to know what you're doing when you get to your worksheet. Because I'm not here to answer questions, and it, is, it has to be done and turned in, and I will grade it. Um, so, looking at this age structure, this is an age structure for Germany. Now, the numbers going up in the middle are showing the ages, how old these individuals are. The ones on the right with the reddish-pink color, those are representing females. And the ones on the left in the blue is representing males. Down at the bottom you have the population in millions. So when it says 3.2 or 2.4 or 1.6, it's not saying there's 1.6 people, it's saying 1.6 million people. So to read this, it's simply two bar graphs that are laying side by side. If I were to ask you a question, so everybody look at the board. If I were to say how many individuals in Germany were between the ages of 0 and 4, or how many females lived in Germany between the ages of 0 and 4 in 2016. Then I want you to think of what your answer is. And I'm going to round. Have I got the answer? Okay, so between the ages of 0 and 4, there were about 1.6, or you could say 1.7 million females in Germany. Now, if I had asked you how many people were in Germany between the ages of 0 and 4 in 2016? That's a completely different answer. Because if I say people, I didn't specify male or female, so therefore you need to tell me both. So you would add them up. And you're going to have to do this on your worksheet in just a second. That's why I'm going over this. It's going to ask you how many people are in a specific age range. 
Well, to find that out, you have to add up the bars on both sides for that specific age range. So looking at this one, if I want to know how many people live in Germany in 2016 between the ages of 0 and 5, well, I've got to look at the bottom four bars. So I'm going to do the female side first. And I'm going to round just to make my life easier. So females in Germany um, were between the ages of 0 and 4, there was 1.7 million people. And there, between the ages of 5 and 9, for females, there was also 1.7 million people. But remember, I've got to add up the guys as well. So in Germany in 2016, there was about, let's say, 1.8 million boys between the ages of 0 and 4. And then there was also 1.8 million boys between the ages of 0 and 4. So to find out how many people, I simply add up all four numbers. So 1.8 plus 1.8 plus 1.7 plus 1.7 equals 7. So I would, my answer to this would be is there were 7 million people in Germany between the ages of 0 and 5 in Germany. So again, the way I got that was I added up both males and females in both age ranges. Um, so 0 to 4 and 5 to 9. Um, because that's what it was asking me. I hope that made sense. I, at least to one person. If it made sense to one person, then you are the lucky one who gets to explain it to the class. If it does not make sense, then um, you can go ask a math teacher, and I'm sure they can come over and show you how to read the graph. So here are three age structures that are going to be very similar to the ones that are on your um, handout. So if you want to go ahead and pass out that handout, um, you can get that ready. Um, this is what the front side is going to look like. It will have these, the rapid growth, slow growth, and no growth. So it will look very similar to this. On the front side, with these three graphs showing, the questions on the bottom are going to be answered based on the numbers that you see here in these graphs. On the back side... Okay, you're going to have a bunch of questions, and then on the bottom, it's going to have a space for you to make your own age structure. Now, on that back side, you are going to need to draw your age structure before answering the questions. So I'm going to repeat that. On the front side, that has the three age structures that look very similar to the ones on your screen right now. The questions below it are answered based on the, these top three graphs. On the back side, the questions up above, they are answered based on the graph that you draw, which is actually located under the questions. So that will help you. Um, to graph your age structure, you're just making a simple bar graph. It's just laying down on its side. So when it asks how many males were between, you know, zero to four or whatever it's going to give you a number you just draw your little line and then you color it in and to make that go a lot faster for you what I would do is use something like a highlighter and then you just have to draw one line rather than coloring everything in with a pencil so work on that I have one other thing to bring up there's a people usually have a question about um, factors that could make men typically women live longer than men and so there's a question on your worksheet that's going to ask why. What are some of the factors that might cause women to outlive men? And you can think of some. There are some stereotypical ones that, um, you know, are likely to play some sort of a role in them. So I will let you think about that. Um, but a couple of things are men. Typically, you see them having more labor-intensive or sometimes more dangerous jobs. And that could cause them to have a shorter lifespan. Um, you also see women. Um, women are more likely to go to doctors sooner. And women are also more likely to eat healthier. Because typically women are watching their figures. Um, and so because of that, those are two factors that might contribute to women in general outliving men a little bit. Um, those are just some examples. But I do have the answer key filled out. So you know, work as hard as you can, ask each other for help if you need it. 
Um, but the teacher in the room will have the answers as well as if, you, if you need anything. Well, have fun with your graph. I know you just can't wait to get to it, and I will see y'all later.